Hello, I'm Kenny Rice, and welcome to this, the Horse Racing Show, episode number 19. We have a big show again today. Tim Layden, senior writer from Sports Illustrated, will join us. What a wordsmith he is. He covers many things, including horse racing. And we'll be talking with one of the greatest jockeys of all time, Lafitte Pinkai Jr., who for many years was the leading jockey in America. More emphasis now than ever probably on jockeys, the controversy in the Kentucky Derby, and John Velasquez being unseated in the Preakness. And it just shows how tough it is to be a jockey. You can argue about a lot of athletes, pound for pound, they might be the best out there. They're certainly among the best. When you consider guys weighing about 112, 115 pounds and are guiding horses that weigh 1,100 pounds or more, and they're going 30 miles an hour, and in many cases they're swapping horse flesh because they're side-by-side -side brushing against each other, witness the Kentucky Derby, uh, then the emphasis is more on jockey. So we'll talk to Lafitte Pinkai Jr. We've had his son, of course, on the show, and uh, get his take just on racing today compared to racing when he started in the United States all the way back in 1966. And then I'm sure Tim Layden has many things to say about what has been the wackiest without a doubt, triple crown in history, uh, given what happened in the Derby and uh, given the attention given to a horse that was running around the track without a rider. I understand on Twitter that that was posted more than anything else that happened of War Will's victory was the fact that Bodie Express is running around without a rider on him. And some people were surprised by that. But it is the nature of the horse. They're pack animals. I like dogs out there, you know, they all want to run. So if they're out there running, hey, my, my buddies are running, I'll run with them. When they turn around, I'll turn around and keep running with them, jogging out in that case. And uh, that's exactly what he did. Fortunately, everybody was okay. That's been the main thing. Sadly, there was another death at Santa Anita this week. It continues to mount up. Uh, it continues to make news. It continues to be controversial, and I don't know if that's ever going to stop the controversy this year. There's never been a year like this in horse racing, and most of the attention has not been positive for horse racing this year. Uh, so with the Santa Anita death, uh, again, some focus on that. There are groups that want to ban horse racing altogether. There's groups out there that are just waiting for a moment to try to ban anything or to try co to cause controversy. And this is not to uh, try to put aside what has happened at Santa Anita. But uh, it is a sad situation, and I do hope that eventually there is a definitive response as to what exactly happened out there to cause so many of the horse deaths. I don't think all of them are related. The vast majority, though, are. And that would be nice to at least have some kind of, if not closure, at least a little better description. It would probably help out in the bigger picture, eliminate some of the confusion because there's a lot of confused people out there. There's still people that were at the Derby that's trying to figure out what happened at the Kentucky Derby. Oh, they know who was declared the winner, but they still don't understand that disqualification. Having said all that, Lafitte Pinkai Jr. will be coming up a little later on. And of course, time to bring in our own all-star researcher, Thomas Kenny, once again. So Lafitte, I told you that I said, Lafitte Pinkai Jr. is the winningest jockey of all time. And quickly, with your analytical mind said, no, you're wrong. You said it in a nice way, though. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, Russell Bays has yes. won the most horse races out yes. of any jockey in North America. Yes, he has. And, and I knew that. And when you said that, I knew that. And Russell has been like the king of Golden Gate. Uh, Golden Gate Fields just outside of San Francisco. He, he has dominated that track like probably no jockey has ever dominated any track in America. He pretty much cornered the market over there. He, he has an incredible streak of how many wins over how many years at Golden Gate alone? Pretty much every year for about 11 years, he won over 400 races. At that track? At that track, yeah. Wow, that'll help build it up. <laughs> so pretty much if you were going to Golden Gate Fields over there, you wanted to win your bet, you bet Bays every time. <laughs> you just bet Bays, 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 Bays. And he teamed up many of those wins with Jerry Hollendorfer, who's a great trainer, like Bays is a great jockey, and together they're close to unbeatable out there. And they've teamed up a lot in California, not so much when they leave the Golden Gate State. Russell mm -hmm. hasn't raced a lot around the country, so for as good as he is, and he is the winningest jockey of all time here, uh... Maybe some people are not familiar with him. Even some diehard racing fans probably immediately 
even though they know he broke the record several years ago of Pinkai, uh, it may not jump out at them, perhaps because of that, because he has been uh, pretty much provincial. He, stay, he stays at home, and he wins at home, and he wins big. That's right. You know, he has a couple wins outside of California that are, you know, pretty notable, like the Oklahoma Derby, mm-hmm. I believe, 1996. Uh, you know, he's won a race at Churchill Downs. I think it was a handicap race. Right. Uh, but, you know, you don't hear about him as far as, you know, triple crown talks. Yeah. Or, you know, anything like that outside of California. You know, a lot of the East Coast tracks, you know, you talk about Russell Bays, they'll say who? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's true. And, you know, everybody knows Pinkai. Who else is in that list outside of Bays, Pinkai, or 1-2? Well, you know, you've got, obviously, Bill Shoemaker. Yeah, Bill Shoemaker 3. The classic. Yeah, he he was the the shoe was the standard, and, and some still maybe regard, regard him as the standard. I'll, I'll be curious when we talk to Lafitte in a few moments uh, who he thinks is the standard because he was there. He was a young writer when uh, Shoemaker was kind of setting the standard there. Mm-hmm. And then Pat Day, Pat Day, number four, over 7,000 wins. You know how I know that? Why is that, Kenny? Because, Thomas, I'm glad you asked. Because I used to go to a, tr- uh, a park when I was a kid in Huntington, West Virginia, called Camden Park. Scott Hall. I remember. Has been to Camden Park. Bet. Ben Chaffins may have been to Camden Park. Have you been to Camden Park? I have not. Well, well that's a summer. I don't think I've ever been to West Virginia. Well, that's a summer excursion for us. Uh, I used to go there in the summers, and it was the Tri-State's favorite playground, Kentucky, Ohio, West Virginia, Camden Park. And I only remember that because Pat Day, the horse that he wanted on, that Mark Stanley owned, was named Camden Park, and that's what he won his 7,000th race on. Wow. <laughs> that's all I got, okay? That's it. It's not like I can tell you anybody else that won on any other horse what milestone it was. But that I do one remember sticks out for you. that one stuck out just because of the name of the horse. Uh, let's see. Chris McCarron is up there. Angel Cordero. Who else? That's a pretty good list you got. There. David Gall. David Gall is in at, uh, what was he, number five? Four? Number five, yep. Five, okay. McCarron, where's he? Karen is six. Okay. So there's some jockeys that people might be surprised to hear, but there's some that probably aren't in the top 10. They had great careers. They won over 6,000 races or thereabouts. Uh, Jerry Bailey, Gary Stevens that have been on. It's kind of surprising that you can win that many races and not be in the top 10. Isn't it, though? 6,000 races? Nah. (laughs) Unremarkable. Unremarkable. That's like 2,999 hits. Yeah. Not part of the 3,000 club. Not part of the 3,000 club, although obviously anyone that knows them. And, you know, in different styles, different riders, these guys don't ride as many mounts as some of these guys that are in there. Uh, like Gall and Bays is particularly, they ride a lot of horses. They've ridden a lot of horses. And that, that's probably one of the reasons, mm-hmm. I'm guessing. Did you, did you enjoy that? But Lafitte, uh, what's Lafitte done? Lafitte Pinkai, he's done a lot. We know that. He's won 9,530 races. Yeah. So what else about his resume that you have researched that you have right there in front of you? Well, among those 9,000 races he's won are four Triple Crown races. Yes. Two Belmonts. or no, Sorry, three Belmonts yeah, and one Derby win. No Preakness, unfortunately. Yeah, he did not get into the Preakness, I don't think. That's right. That, that was really strange. But, yeah, what a run he's had. And I look forward to catching up with him and been wanting to get him on the show. And he listens to the he listens to the show, as do many of you, and we appreciate that. And uh, around the nation, people are listening, and around the world, people are listening, as far away as Dubai, uh, throughout Europe. Uh, that's nice to hear. So a lot of horse racing fans out there that like the stories that we're telling, apparently. <laughs> Someone's listening. I guess we're doing a good job. Uh, <laughs> we must be. At least we keep showing up each week. We're That's glad right. that you do as well. When we come back, we'll talk with Tim Layden of Sports Illustrated. Get his take on what has been a certainly wild, unpredictable Triple Crown. That and more. Stay with us. You're watching or listening or both to The Horse Racing Show, Episode 19. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. We're glad that you're with us. Thanks for tuning in uh, on the many outlets that we have from uh, YouTube to iPad to Google Play and uh, 
This is episode number 19. We talked about getting as good as it gets guests. We have one of them right now. He is a master wordsmith, senior writer for Sports Illustrated. And here's what makes a great writer, in my opinion. This line, this is the story of two horses, one ridden by a jockey and the other riderless. That perfectly sums up the Preakness. And now we bring in Tim Layden. Tim, welcome into the show. Hey, thanks, Kenny. Great to talk with you. And I did love that because that was the Preakness, wasn't it? We had Mark Cassie on last week and half jokingly he said, John Velasquez stole my thunder. More people have talked about Bodie Express running around the track than the fact that War of Will won. It's crazy, you know, and I sat there for like, uh, you know, 15 minutes looking at a blank screen in the press box saying, you know, how am I going to, how do I get my arms around these two stories, which, you know, I, it was funny, I, you know, I, I thought, well, I'm not going to make too much of a big deal of this, of this, uh, you know, loose horse. And, and then I started looking at social media and people were texting me and all anybody wanted to talk about was the loose horse. So I thought I better, uh, you know, I better make this a, uh, a, a dual lead here, I think, because I think people were really fascinated by that. I imagine that some of your friends that uh, you cover so many sports, uh, you know, Olympic sports, NFL, et cetera, like some of my friends in the boxing world or in the basketball world, they legitimately were asking me, what if that horse had finished first? Would he have been declared the winner? So I spent probably like an hour of my life explaining to them that he would not have been declared the winner, but uh, people would have talked about it as much as they are now. I know. And in fact, it's, it's, we're what, we're like uh, 10 days since the Preakness. And, uh, you know, we had a guest in our house last night. And the first thing he said to me was, you know, I got to ask you, can a horse run around like that and win the race? And, and, you know, I, I've had to explain it like 20 times. And the, the thing that, the, the thing that seems to confuse people that aren't in the horse world at all, um, is they said, well, you know, that poor horse had to ride all the way around alone and he might've won. And, I said, well, he also had to ride all the way around without 126 pounds on his back. So, I mean, there's a, you know, it's, it, and I don't want to make light of what could have been right. a really bad situation, you know, but, but that's the most basic thing. You know, the rules say you got to have a jockey on your back and, uh, you know, if you and I want to go have a race and, uh, you know, I get to run just in my shorts and t-shirt and you got to carry, you know, roughly, you know, 10 or 12% of your body weight on your back let's 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 try that and see who's uh, <laughs> see who wins you know and uh it was it, it was a very interesting situation and uh you know kind of, yeah it's one of those moments kenny you know that when you're when you cover racing you always have to keep in mind the extent to which your audience right you know knows exactly what you're what they're seeing you know the the hardcore racing audience understands all this but you know, all of us that are even close to the sport know that you got to expand in any sport. You know, you want to expand the, the readership, the viewership and uh, to reach those people that had never seen anything like this. You kind of had to write about it and uh, or, or talk about it um, or show images of it, you know, whatever your platform is. And uh, it was a really, really, you know, a, a very unique circumstance. Tim, I don't know if we're going to have another Triple Crown season. Who knows what's going to happen next week at the Belmont? But given the Derby and and given the Preakness, uh, I've never seen anything like this. And uh, given what happened, the tragedies at Santa Anita, uh, I don't know if there's ever been, and probably there should never be another year for horse racing like we're experiencing right now. Yeah, it's been um, it's been really wild, and uh, and it's been it's been wild in a way that you really have to be careful how you present it and talk about it to people. Right. And, uh, you know, the, the Santa Anita thing. And, and now I saw that, you know, there's been calls coming out today to ban, uh, ban racing or uh, across the country until, until they reach zero deaths. Um, which I think most people in the game realize is not achievable. Um, but it is a, the absolute correct goal, but, you know, you, you had all those issues at Santa Anita, which were framed in very different ways, and not everybody understood that there may have been things going on that weren't necessarily being addressed or, or being talked about. Um, and I, I mean, the, the track condition and the weather versus whips and drugs, and not saying that everything can't be a part of the equation, but it was, I think, very confusing to people. And then we got to the Derby, and, and people immediately said, well, this is another black eye on racing. And and my view of the Derby was, you know, it was a painful night for everybody because, you know, those 22 minutes took, you know, 22 years to go by to, to, to get that DQ up. And I don't think the stewards handled themselves 
the, in the best way possible, and they may have gotten advice not to. Um, that will all come out in the wash eventually. Um, but at the same time, the Derby was a sporting event where an official's call was made that upset a lot of people. But that happens every day in sports, and people get angry about calls. But you know, I think more people at the end of that felt that the officials, however they handled it, got the call right. Um, and I understand that a lot of people don't think that because – it was the favorite or near favorite that came down, so there was a lot of money on his back. Um, but I didn't view the Derby as a black eye. I viewed it as a as a as a challenging night for everybody or evening for everybody. But the it was just a referee's decision that affected a sporting event, and uh, that's the way I looked at it. And uh, and the Preakness, you know, it was a great, it was a really good horse race. And War of Will proved himself to be a terrific racehorse. Doesn't mean he would have won the Derby. Um, and the, the loose horse in the end, again, Johnny Velasquez didn't get badly injured. Um, the horse did not get injured. Um, the outrider didn't have an easy time, of it, but eventually she caught the horse and no bystanders got hurt. And, uh, so again, it was unusual, but, but I don't think bad, but you know, there's, we in the media and you and I are part of it. Yeah. You know, we, we, we can be guilty of trying to wrap our arms around everything and, and giving it all one theme and, things are usually more complicated than that. I think the racing season has been more complicated than that. We we're talking with Tim Layden of Sports Illustrated, also a contributor to NBC and their horse racing coverage and wrote a brilliant essay about hold all tickets was the punctuation at the end, which is why they say hold all tickets talking about the Derby. And you equated so many things that happened. And one of them that I can relate to as a kid watching the 72 Olympics when the U S should never lose, but they lost to the Soviet union and I have a friend, Kenny Davis, who played on that team, who I think in uh, has has in his will that will go on, you know, decades after he's long gone, that no no heir will ever collect that silver medal, <laughs> you know. So that went through yeah. my mind, you know. And I think that's one of the great things, and that's what you do so well, and what Rob Hyland, who was a guest last week, our producer, does, and we all the rest of us try to is relate other sports because. Horse racing as itself is not the sport that everybody follows anymore, you know, like they did in the 40s and 50s. And I do think analogies play a big part in that. Uh, and you did that brilliantly, I thought, uh, with your essay showing other sports that have happened that have had controversial endings. Yeah, and I'll give I'll give credit to Jack Felling there, who was another guy you know, Kenny, who's oh, yeah. a, a feature producer at NBC. And he reached out to me right after the Derby and said, you know, do you think there's something to do in an essay that talks about people who thought they had something won and then they didn't win? Um, and we even got into like the Oscar thing with Moonlight and La La Land yeah. and, uh, you know, and the Miss Universe thing. And, and there's a lot of ways that this can go. It, it really is a big part of sports where, you know, either while the game's still going on, you think, you know, we got this thing won. You know, it's a basketball game. We're up 10 with a minute to go. And, uh, you know, a football game and, and we're on the one yard line going to wrap it up and and uh, and stuff happens. And and in horse racing, you know, the thing I kept coming back to was, you know, in all of us who have ever watched a horse race or made a bet on a horse race, you know, we know that, you know, there, there's that minute when they cross the finish line and then you wait for that official light to go up on the board, even if it looks like nothing could possibly have happened. Sometimes something happened. And, uh, you know, that's why, you know, I got hold all tickets is that line that if you had the winner and you hear hold all tickets, your heart just sinks. And uh, but if you had somebody else in the race, particularly the runner up or the, the third place horse and you see what you hear, hold all tickets, it's like renewed life, you know, and uh, and and I do think it happens in every sport, maybe not in quite the same way, but uh, but but it, it's it's not over even when it's over sometimes. And the Derby was that kind of race. And uh, the fact that it was the first time in 145 years was just kind of disruptive to everybody. Tim, you know, I thought about that because one my favorite movie in racing of all time, and we had Michelle Phillips on who played Mrs. Davis in that movie uh, several weeks back is let it ride. And I always think, cause I got friends like that, that are looking on the ground for that winning ticket. That's been accidentally either dropped or discarded because they didn't hold all tickets. There's yeah, and I think I, I think there was a story in Louisville. Somebody wrote that there were like a lot of a lot of tickets picked up on on Country House. Yeah, um, at in on the grounds at Churchill. You know that uh, there's a lot of people there that day, and uh, you know, I don't know if it's an urban legend at this point that that people found uncashed tickets on that horse, but um, I could certainly see why 
you would have tossed your ticket. Um, and then, you know, it's hard to get out of Churchill Downs. You know, you head toward the you head toward the exit, try and get an Uber or a cab or whatever. And, uh, you know, and you just throw that ticket away. And, uh, you know, someone maybe looks around for it afterward. And uh, I got a buddy that uh, sent me a picture. So I know he made the bet. It was like 300 bucks to win on uh, maximum security. He asked me uh, with the litigation, everything going on, is there ever a chance he'll cash it? I said, no. You know, maybe no. eBay. You might get some eBay money back. I don't know. Maybe it'll yeah, be a collector's yeah. item, but don't don't hold on to that ticket for any other reason. No, I, that's that's I, I you know people have I, I'm <laughs> sure that there's litigation somewhere where people have managed to make something out of a out of a losing ticket. Um, but uh, you know, there's a lot of people with tickets on, and I think there's already class action suits and uh, <laughs> things like that. But you know, it's it's not going to happen. Once that official sign goes up, it's uh. You know, the the heck, Kenny, the for one of the first big racing stories I ever wrote 30 years ago was about a horse that got dis- DQ'd at Saratoga. And what happened was the stewards um, saw the wrong uh, number on the saddle cloth and yeah. and they someone yelled, you know, well, it was the eight or maybe it was the nine. I can't remember the number. And they all got it in their head that that's the horse they were taking down. And they took down a horse that was the winner. And he was a good price, and he was live that day, and a lot of people were on him at, a, you know, at like I don't know, five or six to one or something, or eight uh-huh. to one, and uh, and the stewards took him down, even though he had nothing to do with an incident <laughs> in the race, and it, it became a real thing. And I, I wrote a big piece on it a year later, and all three stewards lost their jobs, and uh, and and had and really struggled to try and regain their footing afterward, and. There were a lot of lawsuits filed and, uh, you know, it was, but none of them successfully. And, uh, and that was a case where the stewards admitted the next day that we got it wrong. And, uh, but by then, you know, as you could tell your friend, it's too late. Yeah. You know, once, once that official goes up, it really, there's no way the system is not set up to, uh, to get all those tickets back and make, and, and make all those people whole that had that horse. So it's, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe someday there'll be a different way of doing it in racing. But um, right now, if that official goes up, it doesn't matter what happens afterward. How did Tim Layden, young Tim Layden, get involved in horse racing to become the writer that he is today covering it for SI? I was, um, you know, I grew up in upstate New York, about an hour from Saratoga, but never went. You know, I played football, basketball, ran track, and right. loved all the mainstream sports. Really didn't have any interest in, you know, I wasn't like uh, Akita grew up in Louisville or Lexington or somewhere like that, you know, and uh, didn't have horses in my family. And uh, But my first summer internship was at the Schenectady Gazette. I was a junior in college, and Schenectady, the Schenectady Gazette covered Saratoga for, you know, back then it was four weeks, 24 days. Right. And, uh, and one day the... Uh, the guy who covered Saratoga said, I'm, you know, I'm away this weekend. Why don't you want to go up and cover the Alabama? And, uh, I said, yeah, sure. You know, it's a major, major league event. So I went up there in the morning and interviewed a couple of people on the backside just to, just for the exercise of doing it and covered the race. And, uh, I can't say I was immediately smitten. The thing that I, the thing that I liked about it was that it was a big time sport where I had, you know, been doing little league baseball tournaments. And, uh, mm-hmm. so it was a chance to get around, an event where there were 30,000 people there and, and, and a lot of money on the line and the top people in the sport were there. And, uh, and, and then, you know, the next summer I covered a few more days and when I went full time, I was in that Albany area for 10 years and just spent a lot of days at Saratoga. And it's never been the primary thing that I covered. Um, you know, I think that, you know, for me, unless, unless you work for a racing publication, it's hard to, hard to be only involved in horse racing. It's, yeah. uh, it's not big enough. And, uh, so I cover racing a few months a year and, uh, sometimes only a few weeks a year. And, uh, and, and, and I really enjoy it, uh, as a, as a change of pace from mainstream sports. I like the authenticity of it. The fact that you're dealing with people who've had, you know, uh, life experience, you know, it's, uh, there's some fascinating young people that play basketball and football, but in a lot of ways they're, their experiences are very, very homogeneous. They just, they, they were great athletes. They, they got a scholarship, they got drafted. Now they're in the NFL or the NBA. Now they may have some life history. That's a little different, but you know, you get jockeys and trainers and owners that have really got some, some wear on the tires and, yeah. uh, and they have great stories to tell. And, uh, and I, and it's fun to tell those stories. And, and even beyond that, sometimes you get a whole lot of drama like we've had this spring. So it's, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, it's not something that I've ever done 12 months a year, but when, when I'm involved with it, I find it really fascinating. And, 
you know, I said to somebody else that interviewed me about this once, you know, they said, well, why, why do you pick these horse racing stories? And I said, look, a story is a story, you know, especially in the modern media where there's so much digital content and, you know, you want people to find what you're writing. It better be good. It better be interesting. It better be different. And, uh, you know, racing has a lot of stories that fit that. And the, the best racing stories I've found and written get widely shared and read and, and because people just like stories and racing has stories. So, you know, I, I just uh, sometimes they're not great or positive, but, you know, that's true of any sport and any 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 anything you cover is going to have negative and positive. But racing just has good stories. And uh, that's why I like it. And the Belmont, I'll see you there. Wow, this could be interesting. What could happen next, Tim? This is a what can happen next moment going into the Belmont, isn't it? And we know War Will is going to be there. Uh, who who knows how it's going to play out? But yeah, you know, I think the things that have happened without the Triple Crown on the line immediately, as we knew not long after the Derby that uh, Country House wasn't going on, it certainly right. kept it more interesting than honestly I thought it ever would. I, I didn't know what we were going to keep doing, you know, the rest of the way to come up with story ideas, but. Uh, given the way it's playing out, I think it'll be an interesting Belmont for just some of the reasons, wacky or otherwise, that have happened along the way this time. Yeah, I think, and I think War Will has a chance to. I mean, look, to be realistic about this, the the Triple Crown is a great entertainment product. You know, for NBC, for all the the publications that cover it, for Churchill, for Pimlico, sometimes, yeah. and and for Belmont sometimes, and and. You know, but there's a flaw built into the system, and we all know what it is, which is, number one, if the Derby winner doesn't go to the Preakness like this year, the Preakness is diminished by that. It becomes a different kind of event, which there are plenty of ways to cover, and turns out this year it was a, a fabulous story to cover, but there's no guarantee that, that the Derby winner going on 23 straight years after Grindstone is kind of a shock, yeah, really, that, it that, is. That, that, that no horses have ever come up sick or sore coming back in two weeks after the Derby with a rodeo that that race is um, truly remarkable. The Derby winner has come back so consistently, but then you get the Derby, the, the triple crown situation where if the Derby winner does win the Preakness and doesn't, or doesn't win the Preakness. And then you got a Belmont that's not for a triple crown. Then that, that tests everybody's resolve in, in figuring out what the stories are, but, but you can't recreate a triple crown scenario. You just can't, there's nothing, there's nothing to match that. And, and, I don't think we're going to return to a time when the Belmont alone is a big enough race to attract a hundred thousand people to Belmont or a huge TV number. It's just everybody's expectations change. And, and then it can still be a really good race and a really good story. I mean, one year we had rags to riches and Curlin. another year we had a fleet Alex, you know, there's yeah. some, there's been some really good Belmonts that didn't involve a triple crown. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I think War Will is a tremendous racehorse, and I'm really looking forward to seeing if he can kind of be this year's the Fleet Alex, where, you know, when, I mean, that was 14 years ago, which is getting on up there, but um, when that horse won, the, the way he came back to his feet in the Preakness and won, and then three weeks later, he wins the Belmont convincingly. Yeah, I think everybody walked out of there saying, well, there was no Triple Crown, but we sure as heck know who the best three-year-old in the country is. Um, and maybe it'll be a race like that for War of Will, or maybe it'll just be a great race between two or three or four other horses. And uh, and I hope people watch and enjoy. And uh, But it's not the same as a Triple Crown, and everybody knows that, and it's not something you can run from. Blood, Sweat, and Chalk, Ultimate Football Playbook, How the Great Coaches Built Today's Game. If you haven't read it, it's available on Amazon still. And one Tim Layden wrote it. And I always like football. I still like football. I, I love the obit, the tribute to Bart Starr, who I had a chance to meet a couple of times and, and have that chance to sit down and interview him once years and years ago. And, you know, he's one of those guys, you know, you meet that legend. And I remember as a kid watching the Ice Bowl and all that. And uh, it, was, it was really, I was touched, not just by your article, but by everything that's happened this week with some of the losses of, you know, Bill Buckner and these guys that you you watch growing up or when you're a young guy. And, uh, you know, a little piece of you's gone with them, I always feel. You're using, losing a little more of your youth when guys like this pass. Yeah, it's been a tough week. And, <laughs> and I think that for, for guys in our general age range, you know, sort of baby boomers or whatever, um, you know, all the guys that we grew up watching, who in some cases only a few years older than us. Um, you know, Buckner was only 69 years old and Bart was 85. That's, that's a little older, but 
but we certainly he was a hero to a lot of us and and there was someone we watched uh with great rapture and um you know we're getting to an age where you know a lot of these guys are we're going to lose them and uh you know i agree with you that it does evoke your youth and it evokes the youth you've lost and uh and that's just you know that's just the way life is and i think sports the way it moves us when these guys are alive it moves us when they die as well and uh you know, I think you mentioned Blood, Sweat and Chalk, which is a book I wrote a few years ago about sort of about the great innovators of football history and how they, uh, you know, it's not really an X's and O's book, although there's a heavy element of that. It's more about the people who came up with these, you know, Bill Walsh with his West Coast offense or Don Coriel with Air Coriel and, um, you know, the Texas wishbone and all those things. And gosh, you know, I talked to a lot of guys who uh, who conceived these things and a bunch of them have, have are gone in the eight years since I wrote the book. Um, so I'm, I'm glad I had a chance to talk to those people and, uh, and to learn a little bit about their, their inspiration for, for some of what they put together. And, uh, and then the way football, you know, for, I'm sure you have football fans on here, the way football has evolved in the little less than a decade since I wrote that book. I, you know, I think you could do it. You could do another one. You could do blood, sweat and chalk too. And, uh, and, and have just as many innovations in there in the last decade. And, uh, um, but I'm not going to do that by the way. Um, <laughs> but, but there's been a lot that's happened and, uh, but you're right, this has been a tough week and, um, and, uh, it's just part of, part of what you deal with as a human and a sports fan and everything else. I, I love the book too, because, uh, you know, because when you read this, you realize there's not a whole lot of things that are new. There's things that are tweaked and improved on, perhaps. And I liken it back when I was growing up as a kid, we used to go watch the Kentucky Colonels of the ABA, which is a lot like watching the NBA now. It was three-point and slam dunks back in 75 when I was watching George Gervin and uh, Julius Irving and Dan Issel and Artis Gilmore and George McGinnis and guys like that playing. And I kind of see the NBA, which was greatly influenced, I think, by the, by the ABA, uh, and to watch the game now, it's about three-point shooting and slam dunks. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm having flashbacks 40 years ago when I was a boy. Yeah, it's uh, the ABA is, you know, it was such a uh, renegade league, you know, with the with the tricolored ball and the three-point shot and and more of a wide-open game. But but you're absolutely right, Kenny. I mean, that's the ABA has greatly influenced the modern NBA and. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I think Louis Dampier would love to be playing in the modern NBA <laughs> right now, yeah. you know, with a, with a three point shooting and, uh, you know, Rick Mount, you know, I'm sure that there are a lot of guys in, that look at the modern NBA and think, boy, this, this came along 30 or 40 years too late for me, the way they play now. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really, and, and, and you're right that the, the coaches, so many of the coaches I talked to, I mean, I think Joe Gibbs put it best when I was talking to him about his the running game that he put together with the Redskins in the eighties that was so successful and won multiple Super Bowls. And uh, he talked about how he borrowed something from Nebraska and something else from somewhere <laughs> else. And then he said, and what we did here, we thought was pretty original, but I'm not going to say that because no doubt some <laughs> high school coach in, in Kansas has been doing this for 30 years. And uh, you know, he said, there's really nothing new. You, you, you steal, you, 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 you try to innovate, but the likelihood that you're totally new to it, that you're really the, the founder of something in football, really any sport is, uh, is pretty unlikely. Probably someone was there before you and, uh, and coaches in football and everywhere else. I, I, one thing I really learned from the book was that they, you can call it stealing, you can call it borrowing, you can call it being inspired by, but they are happy to pick and choose from what <laughs> other people have done well and try to make it their own. And, uh, and usually to give credit as well. It's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting world that way. Tim, it's been a pleasure. I know you got a plane to catch. I look forward to seeing you next week at Belmont. All right, Kenny. Thanks. Always a good time. Hey, thanks for being on Tim Layden. Yep. One of the best writers out there, senior writer for Sports Illustrated. Coming up next, Lafitte Penkai Jr. Stay with us. This is the Horse Racing Show. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. We're glad that you're with us, and I'm delighted to have this man on one of the all-time greats. You can talk about Mount Rushmore's of certain sports. You talk about jockeys, and Lafitte Penkai Jr. is there. 9,530 wins in his career for many years was the winningest jockey of all time. Still number two, even though it's been more than a decade since he last rode, and Lafitte joins us now. Lafitte, thanks for being on. 
Yeah, you're welcome, Kenny. Anytime. And I'm interrupting your golf game probably because word is <laughs> that you have become an excellent golfer. Yes, I've been playing golf lately, and uh, it's, uh, it's, I love it. You know, I'm glad that I discovered that I uh, could play a little bit and uh, been having a lot of fun with it, yes. It, it, and you don't have to worry about being kicked or thrown off a horse, but I wonder <laughs> if it's as frustrating sometimes as, as when you get cut off yeah. on the rail when you hit a bad golf shot. And yes, it is. It's very frustrating, believe me. You have, you have to... You have to keep calm because, believe me, you can go crazy in the golf course. And I play with friends that, uh, yeah, when we started, they were better than I am. In fact, I didn't even know how to play. And the thing is, uh, I've been playing now for about six years, and I, I've been competing with them. And uh, we play for a little money, and it's a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, we argue a lot, too, but uh, it's, a, it's really good. It's really, really good. You play, you play with Gary Stevens or Mike Smith or any of those guys? No, I haven't. Well, Mike doesn't play. Gary plays, but I never play with him. I play, I play with guys that, that uh, they are in my, around my neighbors, you know, uh -huh. and some of the guys that I know, you know. But I, I play, I play with jockeys, but I don't. Uh, uh, very seldom, very seldom we do. Well, it's a competitive nature, isn't it? I, to me, yeah. I found out that all the great athletes, like you are, uh, any other thing they try, they're going to be competitive at. Have you found yes. that with golf? Oh, yes, definitely, definitely. There is a guy that uh, we always, uh, in fact, he used to own some horses, and uh, we have a rivalry, you know, and, and we, every time we play, and if he beats me, uh, he tees me, and uh, when I beat him, I'll tease him. We <laughs> tease each other on, on the phone, you know, and send them, send you know, my sessions, you know. It's really, really good. It's good, yes. Lafitte, I want to ask you now some horse stuff. Uh, what, what's your take on this year's Kentucky Derby when you're watching your son and the rest of us on NBC and watching those long 22 minutes to decide who the winner was? What were you thinking? Yes, well, uh, I tell you, it's a lot of fun to uh, watch the Kentucky Derby every year. You know, this year it was a lot of controversy. And uh, I, uh, in fact, I bet on the winner. The horse crossed the wire first. And I uh, was excited about it, you know, I make some money and then uh, I saw the inquiry and uh, I started looking at the uh, at the rerun and some of the tapes that, that they were showing. And uh, it really, I called a friend of mine because uh, I told, uh, uh, my friend called me and he wasn't at the track and he wanted me to bet, bet some money. And I told him that I liked that horse. So he bet on the horse too, you know, so... While I'm watching the rerun and 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 saw the accident, uh, I call him back and I say I, I I say I think it looks it doesn't look good. I think that horse is gonna come down and sure enough he came down, you know. And uh, it was it's kind of sad, you know, because that young kid is such a, a tremendous rider. He's gonna be one of the best. He, he is already best, one of the best riders in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, winning the Kentucky Derby, which is very hard to do, and then getting disqualified, you know, it was it was really sad to see, you know. But uh, these two are uh, they have a job to do, and uh, they they I, in my opinion, you know, if I would have been a steward, I, I would have done the same thing. Yeah, and and is it different, Lafitte, riding nowadays as compared? And I don't want to be that guy that always says, you know, baseball back then was better than baseball now, or whatever. That one one era is tougher than another. But is it a different time for jockeys now? These young riders, Saez or uh, anybody else, whoever it may be, is it a yeah. different time for them as compared to when you were coming up? And there were guys like Shoemaker and McCarran and some of the greats that you were riding against all the time. Well, I tell you, there are some good riders right now, uh, very good riders. You know, uh, uh, some of them, they, they are great riders. And, uh, but uh, to tell you the truth, when I was riding here, especially here in California, most of, most of my, the people that I was riding against, my rivals, they were all Hall of Famers. Mm -hmm. You know, we were like 10 Hall of Famers riding over here. And they all had different, most of them had different styles, you know, uh, it was really hard because you will get a guy like Patrick Valenzuela on the lead, which if you don't pay attention to him, you'll never catch him. I don't care what kind of a horse he was on. And then you get a guy like uh, Eddie De La Jose, De La Jose that, yeah. if you, that if you move too quick, he will come and get you at the wire. 
you know, so, uh, and then McCarron, it was always in the right spot, and Gary Steven and Mike Smith and all those guys, you know, Shoemaker. And uh, and some of the other name, no name, you know, no, well, yes, Donald Pierre was a Hall of Famer, too. And uh, and they were tough, tough Friday, you know, Donald Pierce in the stretch when he got on the lead, it was very, very tough to go by. And uh, it was tough. It wasn't easy, believe me. Most of this guy, they have some credentials. They have been, uh, they have done great some, some, some of the time, and uh, and uh, it was tough. They all, they were, they were all, they were all great, you know. And, Competition and, was tough. Oh, it was amazing. I remember the first time I yes. came out there, and, I, and I'm watching some of you guys just walk out. Oh, this is 30 years ago, and I'm walking, so, yeah. watching some of you guys just walk out. You know, in, in an average race, like the third race of the day at Santa Anita, and I'm thinking this, this is like seeing the New York Yankees yeah. in their prime. Yes. You know, this is like yes. if they all came together. And, and so I wonder, yeah. growing up in Panama, your dad was a jockey. Yes, my dad. My dad was a jockey, but I never, I didn't grow up with him. You know, uh -huh. he, um, yeah, he's he went he went to when Venezuela. He was riding Venezuela. And uh, he uh, actually, actually, he left us. He left us in Panama, and uh, we uh, we survived with my mother. My mother got married again, and uh, the first time I saw my father, uh, I remember seeing him one time when I was about three years old. That I remember he came in the hall, in the in the room, and uh, the next time I saw him, I was 18 years old. I was already riding. In fact, I was coming to the United States. And uh, for uh, for some some, I think uh, I think I was leaving to sign my paper with Mr. Hooper. I think, and then he came to Panama to to ride a horse that uh, that I was supposed to ride, and the guy decided to bring him because I couldn't ride the horse. Uh -huh. And uh, and that's when I met him. I was around him for about a week. A very nice man and everything, you know. But uh, but I didn't grow up with him. Yes. And uh, Fred Hooper brought you to the U.S. right about like 1966 or something like that, I think. That that's right. Yes, I came here in 1966. I came. I started riding in Chicago. Uh, I did very well, and uh, and then I went to New York. I went. I did very well in New York, even though I didn't. I didn't, uh, I didn't have any plans to to ride for over there, you know. But I got lucky riding for. I uh, got some mounts from um, uh, Frank Martin. And I won some races for him, and pretty soon everybody was riding me, and I was winning, winning a lot of races in New York before I came to California. And and that, believe me, that helped me a lot. You know, uh, uh, being winning races in New York helped me a lot over here in California. So, uh, yes. And in New York, let's go back to New York a minute, talking with Lafitte Pinkai Jr., one of the all-time great jockeys and one of the great guys to be around. I've had the pleasure of interviewing you several times over the years and uh your triple crown race wins what i think of uh, obviously swell in the 84 derby but i think of that back to back to back belmonts that you teamed up with the great trainer woody stevens with conquistador cielo caveat and swell i mean what kind of run was that for you that you're going back to back to back in that winter circle at belmont yeah that was nice <laughs> that was nice <laughs> you know <laughs> And some of those years too, you know, I finished second. Some of those years, yes. I finished second, yes, with some of the horses for I think well, one was for Woody, and the other one I can't remember. For some guy, last name was Kelly, but uh, but that was a good run, you know, and uh, got lucky to finally after so many years I didn't win a, a triple crown race, and then I, I won one, and then I won another one, and another one, and, and then winning the Kentucky Derby, you know, that was a Winning the Kentucky Derby was a thrill for me. You know, it was the the best experience that I had as a jo as a jockey. You know, I really enjoyed that a lot. Yes. Wow, with all the races you won, that Derby still is the one that matters, huh? Yes, definitely. Yes, and there were some other great races that I uh, that I was that I participate on. That uh, that uh, to tell you, uh, when uh, a fear. Uh, uh, race against a spectacular beat in the Jockey Club Gold Cup. Right. That race was a lot of pressure race for me because uh, everything was on the line. You know, uh, it was the uh, the uh, the horse for the year title. You know, and uh, and it was very very important. And uh, the, the I'm telling you, I, I have never seen so much publicity in in horse racing as at that time. 
it was unbelievable because it was like uh, the west against the east you know right and uh film from the was from the from the west and uh spectacular big from the east and believe me they did a, <laughs> they did a big big deal and i i actually felt some pressure before that race you know and uh uh, I ended up running a good race, really a good race. You know that I think, uh, I think it made probably the difference in the race. Yes. Oh, definitely. And you know, I was thinking about the horses, and you know, we talked about Swell and uh, the other two winners that you had at the Belmont, and then you know, I guess like Genuine Risk. You mentioned Affirm, John Henry. Yes. Do you have a horse out there that uh, a horse or two or three that? Not even necessarily the best horses you ever ridden, or maybe they were, but the horses that you just really enjoyed riding. Well, I tell you, I enjoy ride, riding Sham, even though he couldn't beat uh, um, um, Secretaria. Yeah. But I'm, I enjoy riding that horse. That was a really, really a tough horse. He was a runner. He's probably, he's probably, you know, he's probably the best, the second best horse in history, you know? Yeah. I don't think any of the horses can beat him at, at three. None of the other rest of them. Even though I firm, I always say I firm is the best horse that I, uh, that I that I that I rode, but uh, if uh, if I feel would have run in the Kentucky Derby that year, he would have finished there. Believe me, he wouldn't have beat Jim. Wow, I know that. Yes, wow. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. I always felt sorry for Sham, who also had a <laughs> sub two minute, a sub two minute uh, mile and a quarter Kentucky Derby, because Secretary yes. has the record. People forget that what how fast he ran and how great he ran that Derby. Yes, exactly. And believe me, he and believe me, he was trying. He was trying to win. I, I for sure at the head of the stretch, I, I, I for sure wasn't a winner. For sure. Because when I asked him, when I really asked him, boy, he really switched lead and he just took off. And I saw Secretaria beside him beside me and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that this horse was going by me. Believe me. And uh, it was just a great race for him. And uh, and he did what the trainer told me the night before. The night before, uh, Pancho Martin, the trainer, told mm -hmm. me, this horse tomorrow is going to do something that no other horse in the Kentucky Derby had done before. And he was right. He also brought the track record, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other year, right? Any other yes. year. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. You have so, uh, Yeah. I mean, that, that was, that's amazing. I'm glad you brought it up. Cause I always thought that sham is going to be sadly a footnote and some people are going to forget not the diehard fans, but as time goes by Lafitte, you know, people have a tendency to forget and, and sham's one of those horses that I've always yes. enjoyed. And that I'm glad we got to talk about him. Yes. Yes. He was a really a special horse. Very, very special. And then, and then he brought the, the track record too in the uh, in the pregnancy. You know, after the review for so many years, and there was so many uh, controversy about the race, about the time, and everything. And then at the end, they they find out that yes, that they both horses brought the track record. And then, but going into the Belmont Stake, my horse just got hurt. You know, uh -huh. uh, a lot of people didn't realize that he got hurt, but he did get hurt in that race. And uh, I remember that um, I eased him up the last part of the race, and uh, the trainer was upset with me because he didn't he, he didn't see me riding him hard, and I just took a hold of him. And when he came down the uh, to the track to talk to me, he says, "Why do you let him run the last part?" And I say, "I said, I said, Frank, I said, listen, he he's not lame, but I'm telling you, there's something wrong with him. He he lost his straight his uh, his strength." On the on the on the turn, and he he had nothing. So I thought he I thought he was bled, he was bleeding, but no, he didn't bleed. I said he's not bleeding, you know. So, but there's something definitely wrong with him. And then uh, he wa he walked away. He didn't say nothing to me. He was very upset. So that was on a on a Saturday, and he called me on the Monday, and he apologized to me and he said thank you for saving my horse. Yeah, that's what he said. He said uh, he he uh, he had a fracture, and I can't remember what what leg it was, but he had a fracture on his leg that ended up his his career. And, and you know that just goes to show, obviously racing against the great Secretariat, but just the Triple Crown in general, as a man who's been through it all, 
I mean, that, that is a strenuous th- test for a horse, probably for a yes. jockey as well, isn't it? I mean, yes. the, especially when you get to that mile and a half Belmont, because how many mile and a half dirt races are you in over the course of the year, Lafitte? And then you got to yeah. do it in the, one of the biggest stages at Belmont. Yes, no, it's not that many. You know, you know, it's not that many mile and one, mile one half race. You know, it's not that many, believe me. No. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, but, uh, yeah. Uh, that was that was well that was a thrill for me riding sham and uh and uh you know i in fact that finishing second he, he gave me a lot of publicity <laughs> <laughs> you you got a lot for some other things too i know yeah. along the way i get, i still get that <laughs> I still get to sign a lot of pictures with Sean finishing second, you know, so it's been okay, yeah. Oh, that, that's great. Yeah, you're, you're right. What, what an amazing horse. Uh, who knows, in any other given year, you might have had a triple crown winner if he could have stayed healthy in any other given year. Uh, yes, definitely. Did, who influenced you when you first came to the States, and especially when you moved to California, like you say, you jump in and, you know, there's these guys there like Bill Shoemaker. I mean, there's already some legends in the making uh, when you were a kid, was there a jockey or two that you looked at and said, "Hey, I like that style. I may try to borrow a little bit here and there"? Or did you did you just do it all on your own? Well, I tell you what. When I when I started in Panama, I used to hear about Bill Shoemaker as the greatest rider in the United States, you know. And uh, I came when I came over here. Uh, I came to Chicago, and then I I saw him in Chicago. He came to ride a horse called I think his name was Forley, mm-hmm. an Argentine horse. And I got to meet him, and, and the impression that I had of, of him was, uh, this guy is so little. How can he make these horses run? You know, that's, <laughs> that was the first impression that I got of him. And then, uh, and then I, and then he went back to California. I went, uh, and then I went to New York. And in New York, I got to meet uh, great, great writers too, like Baeza, Nicasa, Agustines, and Nacinto Vasquez and Cordero and all of them, you know, and then from then I went to, to California to, to face Shoemaker, you know, over there. And, uh, and believe me, I, I, I like the style that, uh, Angel Cordero and Jorge Velasquez, which he was a Panamanian yeah. and, and Braulio Baez I had. And I didn't bring from Panama a good style of riding. I thought I looked good over there, but we didn't have, we didn't, we didn't have uh, cameras. We didn't have no film patrol or anything right. over there. So I had to adjust to all that when I came to this country. I want my style to, to look better. I want to look better on the horses. And little by little, I did. You know, it cost me, but uh, little by little, I, I did. I, I, I started to look good on the horses a lot better. And, uh, and then uh, I just kept my style throughout the years the best I could, you know. Oh. But I am those guys. I admire most of them. Most of them, they were really, really. They own, they they had their style, but they they were good at what they did. Uh, in the past, uh, friends of mine, uh, you know them well, obviously Mike Smith, who I know you're good friends with uh, Gary Stevens. These yeah. guys telling me things that, you know, they would watch you al- along the way. Is is there a thing that a jockey if jockeys come to you, a young guy, and said? Lafitte, can you tell me one or two things that I really should focus on to become a very successful jockey, if not a great jockey, oh. at least very good? Oh, definitely. They, yes, they, they want to learn. They ask me for tips, you know, and uh, a, lot of me, a lot of me ask me for tips about eating too, about uh, what I do to uh, keep my weight down and things like that. And I help them out the best I, the best I could, you know. But... Uh, but yes, uh, they, um, they, they, they want to learn, you know, just like, like me, you know, when I was riding, even though in my oldest age, if a rider came, came in town and he started winning races, I want to learn from him. I want to learn, see what I can learn from him. And I always learn something, you know, you never, you never know everything. You, you don't know everything, you know? So I always was up to, to learn. You know, like, uh, and then I studied the writers. You know, I, I'm going to mention two writers that they may, they may, they, they made me change my, my, my way of writing because, because that's the only way I could beat him. I want to beat him in their own game. You know, uh-huh. the first one who came in town was uh, a, a guy called Sandy Holly. Yeah. 
This guy, I have never, never saw a guy that holds a run that could get more out of the run than Sandy Harley. And believe me, none of them, not even Shoemaker. This guy, he didn't have to save ground. He had resources, position in the outside, and he would make a run. And I learned a lot of things from him, why he was doing it, in what way he was doing it. And I started doing the same thing like he did. And then I got to beat him, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, uh, uh, and then the other one was uh, uh, um, uh, Patrick Valenzuela. Yeah. I'm telling you, he could be on the lead, and you think you had him. You think you had him, and believe me, he, you, you couldn't go by him in the stretch. So I started changing things with him. I said, if I want to be this guy, as soon as I have some horse, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my horse, even if I move too soon, I'm going to put my horse in front. And I did. I started pressing him, pressing him early. And that's the only way, the only way I could I start beating him, you know. Wow. But, uh, yes, it was uh, really something else when he was on the lead. Very, very special rider on the lead, yes. One thing I remember about you, talking with the great Lafitte Pinkai Jr., over 9,500 career wins, uh, is that, and and the weight obviously is crucial for a jockey. You're so heavily muscled. I don't even know you've got like 4% yeah. body fat or something. For you, it wasn't a matter of diet. It was just a matter of, of maintaining with, with as heavily muscled as you are. And some jockeys have told me they think you're still the strongest guy to ever set a saddle. <laughs> Yeah, well, when I that's when I was at my best, you know, when I was at my best, when I was really, really good, I was very strong. But believe me, there were many times when I wasn't that strong, you know, that I could, I, I needed to put some some calories on my body because I was just losing water. Yeah, because you couldn't really muscle. afford to eat yes. much, right? I mean, it yes, wasn't a matter exactly. of gaining. I mean, you could yes. gain weight because you had so much muscle. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I, you know, to this day, I have never let myself go. I eat very, I eat still very, eat little, you know, I eat good things now, different things, but good things, natural things. Uh, and uh, I weigh about close to 130 pounds, you know. So uh, uh, believe me, I if, if, if some of these riders will eat what I eat right now, they'll lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I got to ask yeah. you about your son, uh, who has been a good friend of mine. And you know, I met him. You don't remember this? I met Lafitte, your son Lafitte, with you. I yes. don't know when he was a boy out there at Santa Anita years ago. And yes. uh, I'm so happy for his success. And I know that you got to be very proud of the person he is, as well as a great broadcaster. Yes, he is. I'm very proud of him. He's a good son. You know, he always been a good son. You know, and. Uh, Yes, when he was young, when he was young, when he was younger, uh, the only thing he gave me trouble was with his car. You know that he think I used to th I used to tell him that he think he was the king of the city because he thought he could park any place he wanted to, and then I start getting the tickets. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so so let me tell you a story. Okay. So finally, I I I got I got a very upset with him. He was going to Hoover Hoover School over here in, uh, in Glendale. Uh huh. So I got so upset with him because I started getting the tickets and he would not tell me any anything and until the ticket was uh, was overdue and I had to pay bigger fine and everything. So finally, I got so upset with him and I said, listen, you are not driving your car anymore and you are not going to go out and you're going to go down in the den because we had a nice den in that house over there. <laughs> and you're going to you're going to study over there. You're going to study. And then you know what? Why he started doing it? He started watching my racing tapes. Yeah, that was his, that was how he got that idea of going into uh, into into um, uh, being a commentator. Okay. And and then he told me he said one day he said he said Dad I want to be a racing commentator. I said yes, good. Just 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 tell me know how can I help you and I will. And then he started to I don't know I you know he's been so far back I don't remember if he got a job in New York or something about about doing that you know and uh, pretty soon he was on his own you know he was he was he was doing really good he sh yeah. showed me some of his uh, his tape that he done you know and it, I I was really surprised I tell you I was really surprised yeah well, well he learned well you taught him well yeah well. 
I, I think he's just he's just a very smart kid, you know. Yeah. He's probably wasn't that smart for school, but for anything else, he's been very smart. Just like me, I was I wasn't smart in school either. <laughs> well, so you are I, you are I where it counts. Him. You are where it counts, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lafitte, it's been great catching up with you. Do come back and be on with us again, okay? Okay, anytime, anytime. And, and best wishes with the golf game. All right, thank you. All thank right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. The right, great bye. Lafitte Pinkai Jr. Stay with us. We'll have more on the horse racing show right after this. All right, welcome back. A few precious minutes to go here in episode number 19 19 of the Horse Racing Show. Ben Chafin's back from vacation. All suntanned. All suntanned down there in the Gulf Coast. Scott? Yes, sir. You suntanned? Uh, a little bit. Just my left arm from hanging out the window. <laughs> hanging out yeah. the window? You and <laughs> Thomas right. have that left arm <laughs> suntan going? That's it. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks again to Lafitte Pinkai Jr. And I love the story about Sham. Kind of the forgotten horse out there. I mean, imagine that. He's run against, uh, you know, it's like everybody that finished behind Usain Bolt. That's right. Any Second other best year. to the best. Yeah. Any other year, they're the gold medalist. Any other year, who knows? Sham would have won the Derby for sure, won the Preakness, who knows? But I'm glad he brought up that story about the Belmont because so many people, and he talked about it was discovered after that race that there was a fracture in the leg of Sham and it ended his career. There were so many people at the time that said, oh, he just ran his heart out. He just couldn't compete anymore with Secretary. Some of that might have been true as well, but uh, he was injured and, and Lafitte had some great stories and brought up Sandy Hawley, uh, the Canadian, a terrific jockey, not always mentioned among the best, but he was out there in that riding colony that was tremendous out in California, Southern California back in the day. And then he brought up Pat Valenzuela, who has had so many problems and, uh, you know, most of it brought on himself. I've known Pat Valenzuela since he was a kid, uh, but he's been in and out of rehab and all those things. But he's may maybe the best jockey that almost never was. Mm -hmm. And all the jockeys still will, that rode with Pat and against Pat will tell you how good he was uh, and, and what could have been. You know, one of those sad what could have been cautionary tales. And then always good to catch up with Tim Layden of Sports Illustrated, who uh, summed it up, what an interesting year it's been in horse racing, and especially the Triple Crown. Now, speaking of the Triple Crown, Thomas, and we'll be on next week with our Belmont uh, edition, uh, there's a guy out there named Bob Baffert that's won the most, but there's another guy that's won the second most Triple Crown races that's a pretty interesting guy himself. Wayne Lucas. The king. <laughs> That's what a lot of us call him because Lucas kind of set the standard for everybody. Every modern trainer now kind of goes back to Lucas. And what all did Lucas do in his career, which well, is still going on, by the way? He's won 14 Triple Crown races, which is a feat that's... Yeah, you know, only Baffert's beat. That's right. <laughs> only one guy's done better. Uh, and he had his own... He had the Lucas Triple Crown. He did. In 1995, he won the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont. With different horses. Aha. Uh -huh. Thunder Gulch won the Derby and the Belmont. Yeah. But it was Timber Country who won the Preakness. Wow. How about that? All trained by Wayne Lucas. And, and Lucas, I believe, let's see, I'm trying to think of this. He had that, it was that crazy run there like in 90, 94, I think it was Tabasco Cat. Mm -hmm. Tabasco Cat won a Triple Crown race. And then you mentioned he had his own Triple Crown in 95. Right. And then in 96, he won Grindstone, won the Derby, and Editor's Note won the Belmont. Mm -hmm. So, like, Wayne had, like, these six wins in a span of three years. I don't know if we'll ever see that again. I don't know. Bob Baffert. Bob ba Baffert. <laughs> Whoopsie. <laughs> Bob Baffert still got a shot. Yeah, you know, if anybody does it, it'll probably be Baffert. Who I guess is going to run down the Belmont. I don't know. We'll talk more about that next week. He told me after the... The Preakness that he didn't know. He didn't say no for sure, but he said, I probably won't go to the Belmont. Now it looks like he's going to take game winner, which by the time this drops, as the kids say on Wednesday, maybe he's changed his mind. Right. But there'll be plenty to talk. I'm glad War of Will's running, aren't you? He's a good-looking horse. He really is, and, uh, you know, we talked about that with Tim Layden, that, you know, he's he is a special horse out there. He might be the best of this group. He might be. Maximum security, we're not going to see him again until July probably in the Haskell. Country House had some illness. I don't know when we're going to see him again. 
So at the moment, the star of racing right now is War of Will. That's right. And, and that's all due respect out there to, to uh, Bricks and Mortar and McKenzie and these older horses. But, you know, the focus is on the three-year-olds for the general public. The people across America, how many times do you, you know who Gift Box or any of these older horses are? You know, maybe you got to read up on it, but, you know, you, you know the Triple Crown races. That's right. I'm not deep enough into horse racing as of now to really know about the older horses. For me, it's just been a focus on the three-year-olds, the Triple Crown. And, and I think that is. That's kind of the stars, you know. They're kind of like the heavyweight boxing division used to be. Mm -hmm. Not so much anymore, but it used to be the heavyweight boxers were the stars. That changed a little bit with Marvin Hagler and Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, Tommy Hearns, uh, some people like that. Then Floyd Mayweather comes along, Floyd Mayweather Jr. You know, that, that changed a little bit. But for years, it was the heavyweights that got the most attention, just like it's the three-year-olds that still get the most attention. And who knows, maybe by we're still doing the show this time next year, maybe I will know about the older horses. Gee, maybe I will too. No, we, <laughs> we, we will later on talk about the older horses once we get through the Belmont and talk to some of the other trainers. Uh, again, thanks to my guests, Lafitte Pinkai Jr. and Tim Layden. And thank you, Thomas Kenny. Thank you, Scott Hall. Thank you, Ben Chaffins. And thank you for being with us. We'll talk again next week right here on the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. So long, everyone.